I will uh, uh, pass over to uh, uh, Subhash Agarwal for his talk. Thanks, Paul uh, and Lisa. Both Paul and Lisa have asked me repeatedly to be provocative, to be um, uh, no holds barred, to be lively, to be stimulating. So I guess that's an invitation from both of them to be the argumentative Indian in all of 10 minutes. Uh, on a per capita basis, representing a country of a billion people on a per capita basis, that's a very low emission time, but I'll try my best. Um, I, I'm, uh, I'm not really sure if I sort of fit into the theme of the panel. I'll try my best. I'm actually a geopolitical analyst, and I look at the political and geopolitical aspects arising out of the climate change debate. And I'll try to talk about that. I'll try to talk about India, India's stance very quickly, and uh, in a way, how it reflects the developing country versus developed country uh, abyss and chasm that is there for us all, all to see. India is, a, is, a, is an interesting player, aside from the fact that it's the second largest, most populous country in the world, it's also the fourth largest emitter uh, of uh, greenhouse gases in the world. Uh, and given its current rate of growth at 8.5%, it's likely to become the second or the third largest in, very, in, in the next few years. Uh, but India's profile as a polluter is also more complex than that. On a per capita basis, it's actually very, very low, and it's, des and it's going to stay low even uh, for the next 20 to 30 years, even given its very high rate of growth. Its current per capita greenhouse gas emission is, is only about 1.2 tons per annum, uh, as against, and just to sort of keep, you know, use that as, uh, put it into context, it's versus 19 tons for the US, 12 tons per annum for the EU, and about five tons per annum for China. So India is incredibly low in terms of per, per capita basis, but as a total, because of its huge population, as a total polluter, it's actually very, very high. So India's story as a polluter is very complex. It's much more, uh, it's, it's, and there's something for everybody to take away in its defense. And this creates a problem when Indian negotiators meet uh, global negotiators in Copenhagen and other fora. Uh, there's all kinds of things like overpopulation versus lifestyle issues, survival emissions versus lifestyle emission, you know, cross accusations, etc. And I'll just, I'll come to that in a, in a while. Uh, the second thing that I want to talk about is that India, despite uh, its, uh, its uh, defense on a per capita basis, has actually very good reasons to wake up in alarm and wake up with great urgency to the whole issue of climate change. Because climate change is one thing that's affecting India right now, not only in the future, but right now. I mean, the Arctic, the Arctic and the Antarctic ice may be melting and the polar bears may be depleting, but in India it's far, far more immediate and far, far more urgent a matter of survival. There's been huge swings of uh, weather patterns, climatic patterns, floods, uh, strong summers, uh, very harsh winters, uh, floods in the, in, in, mo in the monsoon season. And this has happened in the last four or five years, and I think this was referred to by somebody yesterday also in one of the sessions that just because we have harsher winters doesn't mean that global, uh, global warming is not happening. And I think South Asia, India is a perfect example of that. Uh, down the line, the, the melting of the Himalayan glaciers, which are melting at an amazing sp uh, speed. I mean, irrespective of whether the IPCC chapter report on that was numerically right or not, the fact is the glacial, Himalayan glaciers are melting. And with the melting, you'll have, you'll have the whole Indo-Gangetic plain of the South Asian subcontinent running out of water which will really cause all kinds of huge population displacements, all kinds of social and economic turmoil. We're looking at, we're looking at a scale of disaster and turmoil and, and, and relocation in, in millions, in the millions, in tens of millions, hundreds of millions, not in, in tens of thousands. So the, the scale of the potential disaster is huge, and the signs are there, and it's already at India's doorstep. The next future wars over between India and Pakistan may not be fought over the disputed territory of Kashmir, but over uh, water crises. Uh, so that's the second point I'd like to make. So India has actually not just long-term uh, reasons, but immediate and short-term reasons to wake up and act with real urgency about climate change and cooperate with the, with, with the global community. Uh, having said that, India's stance has been, has been a mixed, uh, has been a mixed uh, story for, uh, for most environmental, social, and legal activists. On the one hand, it has gone along with the developing country consensus in terms of uh, trying to create and move forward the dialogues at different fora, but also it has really not accepted any binding emissions, and it refuses to do that. Uh, and just, so, just to sort of jump into the Copenhagen thing, India was not particularly like, I think, uh, many developing countries. It was neither particularly surprised, nor was it particularly unhappy 
or distraught. I wouldn't say unhappy, but it was not particularly distraught at the lack of success at COP15 at Copenhagen. In fact, the surprise to Indians was why was the rest of the world, especially the Western world, especially European countries, why were they surprised? Because going into Copenhagen, the signs were very clear amongst the developing country, media, public opinion, policy circles, that uh, the chasm between the developing and developed country was very, very huge. Um, Coming to um, uh, why, why, why is India uh, refusing, um, uh, like most developing countries, why does India refuse uh, per capita a very high uh, emission norms or binding emission norms? Because it's, it's trying to play catch up. It's as simple as that. It's development, it's, 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 it's a cliche, it's been said before, and, but it's still true. It's, it's in a way, uh, ideal, in an ideal world, yes, both development and, and environment should be protected. But the way the debate is presented, or at least the, day, the way the de debate is projected in most circles, it sounds like or it appears to be that it's development versus environment. And India is bound by its imperative for development. And development in the Indian context or in any poor country context is not just talking about more cars or better shop, more glitzier shopping malls and uh, electricity through uh, dirty coal for its uh, consuming middle class. I mean, uh, development really means down to schools and classrooms and uh, nursing homes and hospitals. I mean, these are life-saving, essential survival uh, governance issues and, 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 and human issues. And India needs that. It needs that 8.5% growth. It needs coal. It needs energy. Coal is the cheapest. It is abundant in coal. It is the second largest, uh, has the second largest reserves of coal. It is the fourth largest producer of coal. It is the largest importer of coal, ahead of China, in fact. So, you know, uh, for, for India to shift uh, radically away from coal, which it knows it has to do in the interest of the environment, would require a lot of huge amounts of disruption to its GDP growth and huge amount of disruption, uh, even non-economic disruption, because a lot of its economic agencies and infrastructure uh, in place is based upon coal and transportation of coal. So uh, there comes this issue of subsidy. So I mean, I won't go over the obvious things. You you've all know that. So again, we come to the whole issue of development versus environment and the rights of the developing countries to play catch up with the developed country, et cetera, et cetera. The main point I want to talk about, I I'll sort of skip over this because I think this has been said before and you've heard this before. The main point I'd like to uh, sort of dwell on is really the how I see the debate progressing between the developing and the developed country and where I feel that I can sort of talk about the developing country perspective. So this is more than India. I know India represents, uh, is a leader of the developing world, but this is more, more than just India. I think primarily in, in the Western world, in the developed world, I think this debate is projected as or is seen as primarily about the survival of the planet. And uh, there is no, I personally have no dispute with that. But I think in the developing world, it is primarily seen as a, about a fairer distribution of resources and about global justice. You'll hear the, hear the word equity. The word equity has very strange notions and very ambiguous meaning and fuzzy meanings for people who haven't really grown up with it. But in India and developing world, well, Africa, Asia, Bangladesh, I think the, word, the sense of global justice and the sense for equity, the, the quest for equity is very, very huge. It's very deep. It's very basic. I mean, uh, the Western world uh, wants to play by the rules, by clear, simple, fast, immediate rules. And for the developing world, the rules are not as important primarily. They are important, but not as important as behavior and history. Now, this is something that is forgotten, right or wrong. I'm not saying, I'm not defending this particular stance one way or the other. I'm not de defending the developed world or the developing world. I'm just telling you how it is. That right or wrong, this is the chasm that exists in terms of the attitude, in terms of the worldview, and in terms of the rhetoric also. I mean, if you look at the rhetoric, which I have sort of just a sampling of what I, I picked up, you will have from the Western world and Western social and environmental activists, you'll have saved the planet, seize the opportunity, don't imitate us, something like that, or no more coal, or overpopulation in developing countries harms the environment, things like that. And these are said with great amount of respect, with very good intentions, no, 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 no. But these are not received with the same amount of intensity and sincerity and, 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 and perhaps even goodwill and, and certainly efficacy by the developing world activists and policymakers. And this whole subtle nuance is lost in the debate in the formal dialogue forums of Copenhagen and other places that we meet. The developing country, on the other hand, talk about survival emissions versus lifestyle emissions. They talk about that if you, if you say that we are overpopulated, then you're also uh, uh, 
we may be, the developing world may be creating a problem through our overpopulation, but you, the developed world, are creating a huge problem or have created already because of your lifestyle, because of your travels and your houses and your transportation and your cars and all the other things that go into a Western, uh, a good lifestyle, which, by the way, we want to copy. The middle class in South Asia, in India, and in Bangladesh, and in Sri Lanka, in Africa, in, in South America, they all want, they all want the great American dream. Uh, so let's not make, you know, so uh, to say that don't do as I say, don't do as I do, doesn't go down well at any level in the developing world. And unfortunately, that's the chasm that you have between the developed and the developing world. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm time out. I'll end there, but I just wanted to say that uh, I, I hope I've been able to quickly cover not just India, but basically looking at the developing and developed world issues. There are lots of things I have to say, but I'll wait for the Q&A session afterwards. Thank you.